purpose of this video is to talk about something called the proximal convoluted tubule. And the proximal convoluted tubule is part of the nephron, which is part of the kidney, which is the filtering organ of the body. And one of the things I want to focus on is sodium dependence reabsorption. Now we've got to get some background done, and I'm going to fly through some of that background with the hopes that if you haven't seen the video glomerular filtration rate, you go to that first. But I do need to get some things down on paper first, so I'm going to get those down on paper, talk them through, but I probably won't write everything down because I want to save the room for proximal convoluted tubule. So I'm going to start right in the middle and draw something called a glomerulus, and a glomerulus is a tuft of capillaries, so capillaries, that bring in blood to be filtered and something called a nephron in the kidney. Now you got about a million of these per kidney, so you got a million of these per kidney. Bringing in blood is going to come in through the afferents. Leaving, it's going to be the efferents. And these are just arterial, so it's technically the afferent arterial and the efferent arterial. Now what we're going to do is we're going to bring in the whole blood supply 30 times a day. That's about 6 liters of blood in an average male. It's about 300 liters of blood are going to come in here. And about 180 liters of that is going to be turned into something called filtrate. Now filtrate is essentially everything smaller than a protein. So that's going to be a lot of stuff. Maybe the first question you'd ask is where is it going to go? And where it's going to go is through a whole system of tubules. And these tubules have various names. So this is called Bowman's capsule. I'm just going to shorten that as Bowman's. Bowman's capsule basically captures the filtrate in the first day, first place. We've got the proximal convoluted tubule. Looks like it went a little low. But that's okay. We don't really need to know what's going on down there. It connects back. The loop of Henle. And this over here is called a distal convoluted tubule. One of the things we're going to talk about is filtrate goes across here and then we got to get that back into the blood. So the way we get back, that back into the blood is the efferent actually gives rise to another set of capillaries. I'm going to draw it kind of like this. I'm going to draw it in behind. Just trying to draw that it's winding around. It winds around much more than this, but I don't want to draw all that. And this capillary system, they're called paratubular capillaries. So para meaning around, around the tubules, so paratubular capillaries. It's going to return back out to systemic circulation. Now what's going to come through this filtrate is a lot of really, really important stuff. Like, let's do this as uh, glucose. I said, you're going to take this 300 liters, turn it into 180 liters of filtrate, and that's going to mean a lot of stuff is going to get filtered. A lot of stuff, we'll talk about this in a second, that you don't really want to lose. Sorry. Glucose, that says glucose. A lot of stuff you don't necessarily want to lose, you want to get it back into the lot. Stuff like vitamins and minerals. So these would be like vitamins. Sodium. We're going to get sodium back. We don't really want to lose sodium. Maybe small amino acids and things like that. Another thing that I'm going to mention right away is something. The rate that things flow through this is very, very important to control because if it goes too fast, it's called a high glomerular filtration rate. And if, ever, and if everything goes through here real fast, it's going to end up over here. And this is going to head out to the bladder, which means you're going to lose it. A lot of these things in here you don't want to lose. You want to get those back into the blood. Specifically, you want it back into the paratubular capillaries. So if GFR is too high, things you want to reuptake or reabsorb will be lost to bladder. That's a bad thing. Another problem with the kidneys that's not perfect is if GFR is too low, 
then there's other things in here that we might not necessarily want to reabsorb. Things like urea. And urea can actually sneak back into the blood if it's given enough time. So one of the problems with too low of a GFR is waste products, stuff you want to excrete, will leak back into blood. And at that point, it's like, why are you filtering it in the first place? Because you're just letting it leak back in. So this GFR is very, very important. I want to run through this really, really quickly, just so we have this background, but I'm probably not going to write it down much. So one of the main ways you control GFR is the size of this afferent, and that's called myogenic control. This afferent will naturally constrict and dilate depending on blood pressure in order to maintain a constant flow. If blood pressure goes up, then this afferent actually needs to constrict because now we've got more of a push on that blood. We need to constrict the afferent so we've got a narrower tube for that blood to flow so you have the same amount of blood hitting that filtration membrane. On the other hand, if blood pressure out here gets too low, we need to dilate this afferent so we can continue to keep the same amount of flow so that you keep making this filtration the same so you keep this GFR in balance. That's myogenic control. Another real briefly, going to write it down, not really going to write it down extensively, is there are what are called JG cells. And JG cells sit around the afferent and the efferent and they send stretch. And if they're stretched, it means there's a high blood pressure. And what they want to do is get that blood pressure back down. So they stop releasing something called renin. I might have said that in the opposite order, so maybe I'll come back and say, okay, let's say that there's a low blood pressure here, there's a low stretch, then the JG cells will release renin. And renin will increase sodium absorption, and it can also lead to direct vasoconstriction. So it's going to increase blood pressure. If blood pressure is too high, then they stop releasing renin, and that gets the blood pressure back down because now you're not absorbing as much sodium. Another important cell is an MD cell. It's called a macula densa cell. And macula densa cells sit in the wall of the distal convoluted tubule as the distal convoluted tubule passes by the same glomerulus that gave it filtrate in the first place. And these are actually chemoreceptors. What they're going to do is sense sodium concentration because we expect an amount of sodium here equivalent to diet. If there's too much sodium here, it means this sodium flowed through so fast it didn't have time to get back into the blood, and so there's too much sodium here. What they're going to do in that case is they're going to constrict the afferent to get that flow down, and they're going to inhibit those JG cells. On the other hand, if there's too little sodium here, less sodium than diet, it means everything flowed so slow that all of the sodium made it back into the peritubular capillaries. And that means we need to get the, the GFR back up. So we're going to dilate the afferent, and we're going to stimulate those JG cells. The other major player was the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, if you want to change blood pressure long term, can either constrict the afferent, because then you're going to make less filtrate, you're going to have a lower GFR, and you're going to lose that as urine. And that's going to be a good thing if you're trying to maintain or increase blood pressure, you're going to get more fluid in the body. The other thing you can do is stimulate the JG cells, and as we said, the JG cells release renin, and releasing that renin causes sodium reuptake, and increased sodium reuptake, which is going to cause more water to be reuptaken. It's going to get blood pressure back up. Okay, so that's the background on why GFR is important, all the different things we got controlling GFR, but what I want to come down to is down here. I'm just going to circle this right here, because this is what I want to focus on.